Hey, it's Mark here at CG Spectrum. Uh, today we're fortunate to have with us animator James Bennett. James is a animation veteran. He's worked at studios such as Weta and DreamWorks Animation on films that include How to Train Your Dragon 2, King Kong, and Avatar, just to name a few. Mm -hmm. He's cur currently in New Zealand working on the Hobbit trilogy. James, thank you. So, as a student, I would ask you, how did you get into animation okay. and why? And as an animator, I would ask you, what the hell were you thinking? All right. So what the hell were you thinking? Uh, it's funny because I never actually wanted to be an animator. Mm. Uh, all I ever wanted to be was an illustrator. And I soon discovered that I wasn't going to be good enough to be a really, really good professional an uh, illustrator. I was at college and I stumbled across animation, across uh, 3D animation, and just fell in love with it. And I kind of took to it really, really easily. And so then, to answer the question, you don't necessarily choose it, it chooses you. And so... So what do you mean by that, it chooses you? Is it something that you saw and were just immediately attracted to? Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and it's also a case where it doesn't matter what you're doing, because I was the world's worst waiter for four years, and mm -hmm. I was a barman for two, and I was just crap. I was terrible. But the thing is, the entire time I was doing it, I was constantly thinking about stories, I was constantly thinking about movies, I was constantly thinking about something else. Mm. This, is, this is what I always say is, when you do, in your free time, what you do when you're getting paid, that's when you've really found uh, your true love. If you're not giving up, or if you're not spending three of your four weekends doing what you do, or doing your course, or doing your final film, or whatever it may be, this may not be the life for you. Mm. So tell me a bit about how did you go from being a student? So did, did, were you, how, first, how long was your course, your animation uh, training? My animation course was three years. Three years. And I broke it into four. Okay. So from the end of that four years, and I always find this interesting, because there's, there always seems to be a gap yep. between when you finish your training to when you start your first job. How long was that gap, and what was your first job? There wasn't actually a gap. Ah, you're one of those. Uh, I hate these guys. <clears throat> and I was the first intake, and so it was the first year, and it was all about computers. And I kind of figured I'd always be able to draw, but I didn't know anything about computers. I didn't even know how to file open. I had no clue. Did you have any background in traditional animation, being that you're a yeah. traditional-based artist? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And then in my first year, I basically worked my tail off. And then in the second year, I was tutoring the first years, and in my, in my and then for my third year, I broke it into two parts. So I did my third year over two years because I worked full time at a, um, at a small company called Blue Rocket Design. Mm -hmm. And they were doing commercials and all sorts of other bits and pieces. And that was while you were in school? That was while I was in school. Right. Because I was, I was, just, I was just so hungry. I was mm -hmm. really, really hungry. And I, I think that's a big thing is that these days there's so much more competition. You have to be really hungry. And do you think there is an, an innate ability, ability versus a, a, a hard work ethic? Absolutely. Absolutely. Having talent is, is merely the ability to do something difficult mm -hmm. easier than other people. The thing is though, you still have to work at it. I want to talk a bit about what you said about your, only, your demo reel is only as strong as your worst piece. Yep. And why is that? If you have a really nice piece of animation, why does it get discounted by a bad piece of animation, do you think? When people are looking at your work, mm -hmm. they want to know what's the worst that can happen. Say if you were to look at my demo reel and you yeah. see like two or three pieces that were really good, yep. and then you saw a piece that yep. looked really, really bad, yep. you would instantly distrust my judgment. Yes. Is that sort of what you're yes. saying? Yes. You would be like, if, if you know these are good, then yep. why is, does this... Why is this so bad? And exactly. why did you include it? What you don't want to have, for example, put together a showreel that is two minutes of dog shit. Right. No one wants to sit through that. No one wants to see that. Unless it's a dog shit movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So do you have some sort of, when you're cutting your reel together, do you have some sort of method to, to keep that objectivity at the forefront? Absolutely. I show it to my friends. They are absolutely and always honest with me. And that's what's really, really important, is to have those friends who will say things to you in such a way that's still respectful, but they'll also say, yeah, cut that. That's not good. 
Okay, so here's a question I have because a lot of times when we started a new studio, yep. we had opening day jitters. Yes? Yep. You have these? I still get them. You still get them? Yep. I call, How, them, I call them first day back at school. What are some of your techniques for getting over the opening day jitters? Good night's sleep the night before. Not kidding. That's actually really good advice. Yeah, not kidding. Try and get a good night's sleep the night before. The best thing you can do and the most important thing you can do is concentrate on your first four shots. And those four shots will determine, at least in the short term, where you stand within the pecking order. And, right. and, and that doesn't mean I'm going to take my shots, go away and work on them and not show them to anyone mm -hmm. and then go into to dailies and go, ta-da, what you want to do is you want to go away, work on something very quickly, get it as broadly finished as you can and then to show it to one of the seniors who's well respected within, within the team. You want to find that person quickly. One of the questions I get a lot from students, yeah. uh, it's not even from students actually, it's from animators all over the world, because I'm highly connected. <laughs> and I have this issue too. What do you do when you're burnt out, essentially? How do you, how do you get across that enthusiasm gap when, when you're just not into it anymore, but you still have to keep going and still growing with your craft? And to get over that hump, you have to learn how to disconnect, you have to disconnect your own attachment to the work and be professional about it. Now, this doesn't mean that, it, that you know, you're working 80 hours a week, 90 hours a week, and you get burnt out. If you get physically and mentally and emotionally burnt out, what you need to do is take a break. You have to be aware that it's totally natural mm -hmm. and it happens to everyone. But there are two things you can do. You can either change yourself or you can change your scenario. And Quite often what happens is you get into a position where you've tried to change yourself and you've tried to change your outlook because for whatever reason, then you move on. A lot of students when they first start out, they come in with what I call professional pride. It's, I've got this job, it's fantastic, I'm amazing, you know, because I've got this job, so watch out, I can do it. Now I've been through that, I've done that. And, you know, and I've been slapped in the face quite a few times because of it. And you, and you learn, oh, hang on, everyone can do my job. Oh, okay. So it's, it's not as impressive, perhaps, as you might originally have no, thought. No, exactly. The fact that you can do it, you can do that amongst your friends, terrific. That's amazing. But professionally, everyone can do that. So you're not actually getting hired for what you can do. You're getting hired because of your attitude. You're getting hired because you can work in the team. You're getting hired because you can handle the pressure. Right. And so when I say they come in with professional ego, what that means is there's a big, big difference between professional pride and professional ego. And the difference is, sorry, I said before professional pride with, with young students, I meant to say professional ego. The thing is, you should have professional pride with your work, but no professional ego. Ego means when someone asks you to do something, you think, well, I've delivered, this is it. You ask me, here it is. Professional pride is, I'll do whatever you want me to do, and every single time I deliver, I'm doing it at 100%. There's two types of shots. Mm -hmm. There's a shot that is very well thought out, it's storyboarded, and it's pre mm -hmm. and it's given to you, and it's like the characters start here, and they end up here. Just make them go through those motions mm -hmm. cleanly and elegantly. Then there's the shots where a director comes and says, I don't know what I really want, why don't you try something? And I know that there's animators when they get handed those shots, freeze. When a director comes to you and says, you know, just make it look cool. When you're handed a shot where the director has no vision for it and just wants you to take charge and make it look cool, how do you approach a shot like that? Because it's very daunting for some of us. You have to get past the technical issues first because it's really hard to be creative if you're fighting, if you're actually fighting the, the, the instrument or if you're fighting the, the, um, the setup mm -hmm. or, the, or the application. It's super hard to be creative if you can't actually do what you want it to do. Set up a decent rig so you have a good rig to begin mm -hmm. with. And then from there, you try a bunch of stuff. So that's exactly what I did. 
if I was the cameraman and I was actually flying alongside of another dragon, or if I was flying along something. That's a really good point. So you're thinking like a cameraman. Yeah, you have to, you, you can't be going, this is a 3D camera, it's going to do this stuff. It's no, no, no. If I was actually going to shoot this, how would I actually shoot it? If you set it up correctly, then you can play with it. If you don't set something up correctly, you don't take the time. And my workflow is this. My setup always takes me at least a day, mm -hmm. if not a day and a half, two days. And a lot of people look at me and go, that's an exorbitant amount of time for setup, and that's a waste of time. And I say, I fundamentally disagree with that. The more time you can spend at the front end to actually set up your systems and to set up your workflow will save you time at the back end. In animation workflow terms, this is called the long shortcut. Exactly. One of the biggest challenges that a young artist faces, and I say this, this to my students a lot, is even after a decade plus of working mm -hmm. in this industry, every time I get a new shot, I have this like deep fear that this is going to be the shot that exposes me as a fraud. Mm -hmm. So I think what you've laid out here is, is some, some um, ideas on how to get past that. And let's just cap it off by saying, for animation students, it's important uh, to understand that it is a teamwork yeah. environment, to understand that it's important to get comfortable, to understand that everybody who you're working alongside has felt frightened, mm -hmm. insecure, mm -hmm. and that they are your best source. Mm -hmm. My friend, it has been wonderful. Thank you so much for this, for this time. The students love it. I love it. And uh, let's do it again. Absolutely. Everyone say goodbye to James.